Hello everyone, welcome back to a, another rambling video, but it's a bit different this time. Today, we're not talking about the silly cat books, today we're even talking about the silly dragon books. So, Wings of Fire is a series that I have actually read to some degree. When they first came out, I read the first seven books, and then I stopped. Not because I didn't like them, I did like the books, it's just that there weren't any new ones out yet, so I kind of fell off, and then... You know, you wait for one second and boom, there's 15 books, a bunch of other spin-offs, and graphic novel adaptations. Be wary cats on that front, which, you know, haven't seen, but I've heard good things about them. So I decided, I want to reread Wings of Fire. So here we are. All right. So, book one, The Dragonette Prophecy, is a very interesting book, because much like other series, like you know, Warrior Cats Into the Wild, the first book is very important. It has to set up the world, set up the plot, to do all these things. And comparatively to, like, Warrior Cats, for instance, I think Wings of Fire has very strong, you know, parallels to how it sets up its world, but at the same time, I think it does have a few downsides, and we'll talk about it in a second. First things first, I want to talk about the intro to this book, which is, amazingly, the map and character references. So first off, any good series has a map, and the map is a dragon. That's cool, that's pretty neat. We also have character references and descriptions. So it gives us visual representation of what each average dragon looks like, as well as like their likes, their dislikes, their special abilities, and generally their descriptions, because you know, there's no color, which I think is amazing. And it's a reason, it's like, this is a blank slate reference for anyone to do their own art. I don't think it was set up that way, but if it was, that's brilliant. Also, the intro prophecy. I think it's a very interesting prophecy. Right off the bat, it tells us what's going on, who these characters are, who we probably are going to meet, and also generally sets up the plot. I wonder what's going to happen with the prophecy. I don't know. Anyway, is the prologue. The prologue is very dark. I would even say it's darker than the Into the Wild prologue, just because of what happens. So first, you know, they're trying to fulfill the prophecy. They're trying to get all the eggs so that the prophecy can be fulfilled. And so one of the queens, Queen Scarlet, she comes in and confronts the person stealing the egg. I don't remember his name, it's not important. Because, um, he dies. That's spoiler alert. But first, she takes the egg, tosses it around so nonchalantly, throws it off a cliff, and then boom, it's destroyed. She basically kills an infant. In within ten pages. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's not, it's sugar-coated. I will admit, it's very sugar-coated. But not in a bad way, it's just kind of showcase that Queen Starlet is very psychopath at evil. She's just straight up evil, but she's having fun with it, which is cool. And then she takes her tail and impales the hero, the guy who brought the egg, through the skull and just tosses him aside. Which, um, yeah. <laughs> um, that happens a lot in this series. And here's the thing it's one of my biggest problems with Wings of Fire is that. It obviously wants to be dark. It wants to have these like really big impactful moments. But I think the way it's written doesn't really reflect the kind of reality situation. Like, think about it. This guy just got impaled through the head and then thrown away just like like a paper, like a dead weight. It's funny and dark, but also just it's just so nonchalantly that part of me wants to make it feel it's intentional, and part of me isn't sure that was the original intention. I definitely think, and I have this later in my notes, that the way Wings of Fire is written, because much like Warrior Cats, it's written for the intended audience of 8 to 12 year olds. But with Warrior Cats, I think it's written even less so later books, but even still, it's written more so the older aspect of 8 to 12, whereas Wings of Fire is written towards the younger aspect. Which isn't a bad thing, it's just a very noticeable thing, especially considering how much of this stuff happens. Uh, but yeah, after that whole stuff, some of the dragons, they said, oh, we're missing one of the eggs of the prophecy. So what do we do? We'll get a replacement, but they're all dead. So they're going to go and steal one from the rain wings, which they very much hate. We'll find out why soon. But um, overall, this is a very intriguing 
um, mystery, because first we had the prophecy, and then we have the prologue, which specifically shows that the prophecy is already not going to be fulfilled because you're missing one of the dragons. Which is interesting, and definitely a good way to hook the reader in. So then we have part one, and for those who have never read work, um, Wings of Fire before, they're divided into parts, like obviously they're chapters, but it's like part-wise, which I'll get into that later. So first off, I think this is very good world building. Like you have your different groups, and then you have, for the first several chapters, it kind of goes through each like tribe and explains what their difference is. And it's through the character of Starlight, who we'll talk about later, who basically is your exposition character. He's your nerdy, kind of uncertain exposition character, which isn't bad. It's, it's a fine way to do it. Also, uh, the compelling start of basically our protagonist for this book, Clay, the Mudwing, fighting against Kestrel, the Skywing, is very nice. You can see that he is, you know, he's, he's a very stock protagonist. He doesn't really want to fight unless he has to fight. You know, he's strong, but doesn't really want to be strong. You know, kind of generic, but it's all right. And I think for book one, Clay is a very good protagonist because, you know, yeah, he's generic, but he has a good heart. And it's definitely a good way to introduce someone to the world of someone who isn't like cynical or has strong opinions. Someone who has a very good moral compass like Clay is a good way to introduce your world. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about, each book in the series has a different protagonist. There's no repeat protagonists ever, which... We'll get into later books about why I think this is both a good and bad thing. But for this book, I think it's quite good. I think Clay is a very good way to start a series. Um, next, we have like the character dynamics, which... Between all the characters, because you have five protagonists. You have Clay the Mudwing, Tsunami the... the no, Red Ring Ring. Sea Wing. Tsunami the Sea Wing. Um, Glory the Rain Wing, Sunny the Sand Wing, and Starlight the Night Wing. First off, the names of like all the different um, tribes, they're pretty cool. There's also Ice Wings and Sky Wings. You know, that's all pretty cool. And <laughs> when we get to the other ones, that's not until Arc 3. But I like all their character dynamics, because like, they're raised siblings. And each of them have a very dynamic with each other. Sometimes they're friendly with each other, sometimes it's like big brother, big sister. Sometimes it's kind of antagonistic. It's all very unique. And I'm really interested to see, upon a reread, how these dynamics shift you know, with from different protagonist point of views. But, you know, with Clay specifically, between him and Sunny, it's like obviously a big sister, little sister. With Tsunami, it's more like an equal standing. With Gloria, uh, well, not Gloria, Glory. It's more of like an imbalanced kind of thing. Like, you know, they're very strongly opinionated, but you know, Glory's is, you know, more so. And then Starlight, there really isn't a clear connection other than like, he likes him in the capacity that he's smart, and he knows that he's smart. I don't know, it's fine. Um, but you know, I think it's really nice. Um, next, um, really dark. So, when Moro Seeker, who's this, like, the big Nightwing guy, who can apparently read minds, ooh, he comes to, like, catch up, make sure they're following the prophecy, and he finds out that Gloria, you know, is not a Skywing, and he finds out what happens, which... It's been like, what, six years since it happened, and he never checked up on them? Which is kind of confusing, considering, you know, you'd think, you'd think that they would kind of, he would check up sooner. I don't know, that seems like an oversight on his part. But like, he, he talks to them, and he figures out stuff, and he basically tells them, you gotta kill this child. They gotta clear, kill Gloria, because, Glory, sorry, I get them confused. But they gotta kill Glory, because she isn't part of the prophecy. And Kestrel's like, okay, I'll just snap her neck, I'm just gonna kill her. They're just casually talking about killing a child, which is dark, and I love it. And it's very casual, too, so that's very nice. Um, but you know, pretty interesting. And another thing I want to point out here is that when they're kind of doing the stuff to, like, kind of, you know, when they chain Tsunami down, when they kind of set up, like, incapacitate all the other um, Dragonettes so they can kill Glory later... I really like the how they convey dragon strength. It's not inconsistent, mostly. Well, that happens later books. But the way they kind of portray dragon strength, especially since they're all dragons, I think is quite good. The way they describe how dragons move, how they interact with things, how they fly, and how their wing beings impact all things around them. 
I think that's rather nice, and I like how it's conveyed. Um, but, you know, once they break out, once, you know, Clay and Tsunami break out to try to save the Dragonette so they can escape into the world, uh, they meet Queen Burn. Oh, it's Queen Scarlet, sorry. They meet Queen Scarlet, and but like I said earlier, she's fun. She's a good kind of evil. You know, she's funny, she's sadistic, it's very nice. And then, you know, they try to save their friends after escaping her unsuccessfully. Um, one of their friends dies, again, very dark. It just snaps his neck, and then, boom, end of part one. And I have it in my notes, out of the frying pan, into the fire, which is very true. So part two, again, very dark. They're basically taking them to go be gladiators in Queen um, Scarlet's arena. Which, you know, it's kind of dark considering, you know, they're children. But we don't really know how ages work. Yet, I thought it never really explained how ages work. I could have looked this up, but I didn't. I was hoping that the book would actually explain this. It doesn't. But you know, they're children. They're basically children. Like, at best, they're like middle teenagers. Like, they're in their early to mid teens. So, you know, not greatest. I know. And then we have Peril. Peril is, you know, she's cute. She's evil in the sense that she was kind of taught that, but she has a good heart. And that does come into play in arc two, because I should believe she's the protagonist in that arc, but we'll we'll see. But I, I think she's cute. Her and Clay's interactions are very nice. She's clearly in love with him. Woo, romance. This this series has interesting thoughts about romance, but early books they don't really get into it too crazy much. Um again, the world building, sky describing all the sky wings like so like they describe their arena, they describe their culture, they describe the palace and the way that, you know, Queen Scarlet has her throne and all that jazz. It's really nice. I like how they kind of describe it. And also, the dragon fights. So you have Tsunami versus like an ice wing, and then Well no, Tsunami versus a sea wing. Clay versus an ice wing, and it has all this interesting dynamics. You have like you showcase the dragon's skills and also the kind of weight. And it's brutal, and I love it, but again, this is for kids, so it's kind of conflicting. Anyways, um, Burn, Queen Burn, one of the three, um, Sandwing sisters through the whole succession crisis. I would have mentioned it earlier, but it's not really a focus of this arc in the grand scheme of things. It's more of like an overarching thing. I don't know. Um, she's fine. She's kind of mediocre, I would say. In my notes, I said she's kind of... Meh. Which could be the point. Maybe she's not supposed to be the most interesting one. As we'll see later, Blister is much more interesting from a conceptual standpoint, but I don't know. Maybe it's just a preference thing. I don't know. That's what I have. Um, you know. Then, they have this whole Gliderate later fight where Starlight, the Nightwing's in there, and then all the Nightwings come out and save him. And it's really terrifying. Like, Moro Seeker is kind of scary. Which is cool, but not scary and like he's terrifying. It's more so that kind of casual scary. We just kind of show your power in a very stoic manner, which could be boring, but here it works. Then we get some fun stuff. So, you know, they start to escape. You know, they save Kestrel, they save Peril, and they escape. And we find out some interesting things. First off, we find out that Clay has a power because, as noted in the prophecy, his egg was the color of dragons, like pure red. And the power that those Mudwings have is they're immune to fire, which is pretty cool. I mean, it makes sense that they're a Mudwing, Mud, Fire. I'm thinking Pokemon logic with ground and fire. So that works. So he and Peril are able to touch because apparently she's too hot. I don't know. It's a whole thing. We also find out that Gloria has... Gloria. Glory. 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 Uh, they found out Glory has a power, which is to shoot Venom. And no one knew this. No one knows that rain wings have this power because they think all rain wings are boring. But you know, spoiler, they are, but that's besides the point. So she can shoot face melting venom. Like she essentially can shoot acid from her teeth, which is pretty cool and very brutal. <laughs> As we saw with when Clay fight, fought the ice wing, his face started melting, which is pretty cool. I liked it. And like the fake out that we think it's, um, Queen Scarlet that did it. That was good. I was generally convinced by that upon a read-through. 
Um, next we get to part three, aka the family drama slash trauma part. Um, so first, there's the whole drama with the five, the four dragon nits because, you know, they don't like Kestrel, so she relieves. They don't really like Peril because she kind of betrayed them, which, you know, fair, but I think it's fine. And then they also have um, the whole discussion about whether Glory shouldn't leave because she's not part of the prophecy, and Clay really thinks she does. It's kind of mean, but I get why they did it. Um, then, you know, they talk about Starlight, meh. Then they find a dragon battlefield, which is cool. They talk about like how all the dragons are like laid out, rotting away. They describe how the fires are still burning, which realistically, if you were dragons and you did fire, they would remain there for several days. So that's a nice touch. And obviously, because it's a kid's book, it doesn't go into as much detail as it could have, but it does enough to get the point across, which I like. Um, then we have the whole Clay's mom drama, which, you know, it's sad. It wasn't predictable, I'll tell you that much. But, you know, it was a very real realistic scene in the sense that I get why they did it. Could they do something else? Probably. Eh. Uh, but then we get Clay's siblings, which, you know, is pretty cute. You know, Clay interacting with his, like, siblings and the idea with big wings and the reveal that, again, was happening later. I didn't mention it because it was really important. That, you know, he is instinctually protective of other dragons, which definitely would help with his character description. And this has come across later in the series, but for this book specifically, it's very well kind of portrayed. And it's kind of, it's cliche in the sense that, like, it's just trying to justify something. I think it's fine, but... Overall, it's set up really nicely. And then, of course, they set up the fact that they're going to go to the Sea Wing Palace and talk with um, Tsunami's hopeful mom. Because they don't really know for certain that she's mom, but they're kind of certain that it's her mom, that the queen is her mom. Then we have the epilogue, where basically Moro Seeker, Kestrel, and Blister, one of the other three queens, who Blister is just like basically Scarlet, but like a little toned down. Not a lot toned down, just a little bit toned down. So, you know, it's fine. Um, but yeah, they kind of talk about that they want her to be the one that, you know, is the one that survives the prophecy. Because they said that three, two of them will die and one will live. And it's very interesting because Moro Seeker, he says that she's the one that will be win. Even though it's kind of implied to be the prophecy that the Dragonettes will win. So, a bit of manipulation? A bit of manipulation? Per nice. Um, then Casual gets her throat torn out. Again, it's a very casual throat torn out. But yeah, she did. So, you know, it's fine. This series is very, very interesting with how it deals with blood. Just the way it kind of describes it and the way it utilizes it. It's casual, brutal, but family friendly. In the sense they don't really go too descriptive. Even though... If you read the series, you will know how descriptive some of the stuff can happen. I'm very curious, actually, how the graphic novel series deals with this kind of, you know, graphic um, imagery. I've never read them. I might do that just to see, like, comparatively how they deal with it. Also, maybe to get, like, a frame of reference of how the Warrior Cats graphic novel deals with how it does its brutal scenes. I don't know. Maybe just, like, a preference potential thing. Um, but yeah, that was, um, book one. Um, also, Starflight's a, Starlight's a, like, a double agent. That's not really important here. We'll find out more about that later. Uh, but yeah, book one, The Dragonette Prophecy. Pretty good start to a series. I really liked it. Obviously, I have issues with it, like all books. It ain't perfect. But as far as starting a successful series of books, it's pretty good. It's, you know, it's intriguing, it's hook-grabbing, it's very violent, but very fun. Overall, a nice book. And, um, yeah, that's it. So, um, thank you all so much for watching this, and, um, I'll see you all next time. Bye!